on behalf of the Kenny Corridor Collaborative. Uh, we're, uh, we thank you for your interest in the experiences of some other communities in their own dam removal projects. So tonight we'll have a chance to talk with either three or four of the five people uh, that were kind enough to share their thoughts in the video series that you can see on the KinneyCC.org uh, YouTube page. Uh, David Babcock gets a, a special kind of medal for editing, the, for not only shooting those videos, but editing them into a finished form and spending a lot of hours on the on the captioning. It was a marvelous, marvelous job, and we learned a lot from them. So I'd like to have a couple of ground rules uh, for tonight's conversation. Uh, we're here to learn from these other communities' experiences, perhaps some lessons that we can put to use in River Falls and answer your questions. But it's not a time for us to plow over ground that the city and its residents have covered in discussions about electrical generating dams or uh, or licensing by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or what comes next from DNR in relation to the project. We're still in the planning stage for all of those things. So let's talk about how these dam removals affected these communities, what they have now that the dams are out, how the removals gave new resources and new opportunities for businesses in those towns, and what, what lessons they would offer to us as we go forward. Uh, if we get off on what I consider to be a uh, a tangent. I'll step in and ask that we move on. These folks have a lot of positive news to share with us, and I hope we can learn from that. I'd also ask that, if possible, you use the chat feature uh, to uh, submit a written question. That way we can get to it as close as you wanted to ask it. Otherwise, you can raise your hand, and we hope, uh, if you have your video on, and we hope that we'll be able to see that and un unmute your mic. Uh, Judy will be keeping track of uh, hands up and unmuting mics and so on. So um, so please keep your mics muted uh, unless you're speaking, and that'll keep the dogs barking from interrupting us, and it'll keep us from telling them to shush. So And, and you won't be able to hear the ice cubes in my glass if I'm muted. So <laughs> so let me introduce the individuals that we have have on board here uh, that uh, who've offered to share their time tonight. Uh, I don't know who's in which row, uh, but uh, Bob Martini uh, is going to speak with us about the the project to remove the Ward Paper Mill Dam in uh, Merrill. Uh, Bob was a project manager for Wisconsin DNR on that project. Uh, Mike Palm is the mayor of uh, Baraboo and was active in the community, was a member of a, a citizens group at the time that the discussion about the dam removals was taking place and has remained uh, both in as a citizen and now as a the top elected official in the city. And he has a lot to say about the opportunities for businesses. Heath Benneke is a uh, uh, Wisconsin DNR uh, fisheries biologist and river scientist who, uh, who was the project leader for the removal of the 18 Mile Creek Dam in Colfax, Wisconsin. Uh, that was uh, that was just above where the the creek flows into the Red Cedar River, and it was a, a significant uh, benefit to that community uh, to have that that project done. So, um, so it, it, we, I hope that we'll be joined soon by uh, by another uh, individual who was real active in the Baraboo stuff. And that is uh, that is uh, Joe Van Berkel, former Sauk County conservationist. So we'll get on from from uh, uh, from the introductions. Uh, and, but let me let me mention one of our invitees who couldn't make it tonight is uh, is uh, uh, Doug Hill, who uh, led the Baraboo Kiwanis Club project uh, to build a, a walking and biking trail. They were a pretty sleepy civic club, but when the project presented itself, they took it on. And eventually they raised uh, half a million dollars. They found contributions from hundreds of volunteers and dozens of businesses. And they put up benches and shelters and kiosks. And now that trail is used every single day of the year. Doug said, you need the vision and, the pa and people with passion and then people to bring it all together. And not only he said that it helped the river, and the community, but his Kiwanis Club became a lot stronger because it had a, a visible 
effective project going. Younger volunteers joined and are providing the leadership, the next generation of leadership to that club now. And he thinks they won't be afraid to envision and carry out another project because they have the example of one that was already done in their community. So uh, so then let's, let's get started. Uh, a, a question came in from KT in River Falls that can give us a little theme for the chat tonight. She asks, what are the main lessons you can offer to us in River Falls from your experiences in your communities with these dam removals? Anybody that wants to start, if you each take a couple of minutes uh, and, and offer some of those lessons, uh, please feel free. I think one of the main lessons on any dam removal is that there's a lot of myths out there. People come up with all sorts of ideas. For example, one, one person at one of our hearings said that the river below the dam would dry up if the dam was removed because all the water came from the pond. So, you know, those kinds of myths are out there in, in the society and you have to dispel them uh, with information and data. You know, it's, it's a really good example of how science-based management can overcome uh, problems that occur when you, when you uh, rely on myths or uh, ideas that are, are not founded. So it was really important to dispel all those myths. Another one was mm -hmm. that you'd get blastomycosis uh, when the dam was drawn down. Uh, we, we proved that wrong. But a lot of people in the city were really concerned about that because some mm -hmm. people had died of blastomycosis in the county, but it was mm -hmm. absolutely not related uh, mm -hmm. to dam removal. So I think it's really important to be to have uh, science-based management uh, to to dispel a lot of those myths. Okay. Okay. I think it it was also really important in that city that the the advantages far outweighed the disadvantages of dam removal. The economic okay. impact was positive. The cost would have been prohibitive if they had repaired the dam. There really wasn't any reason for doing for keeping the dam because it was only producing about $35,000 worth of hydro, and it was costing about 50,000 for insurance on the dam. And they had paid 100,000 for flooding damage the, the year before. The repairs on the dam were 1.2 million. So it was out of the realm of economic possibility to uh, maintain that structure. Okay. And yet people wanted it maintained, they just didn't wanna pay for it. Okay. Um and, and the owner of the dam in Merrill was a paper company that had bought the local paper company. The paper company that was the buyer, it was out on the West Coast, and they closed the mill down and they wanted to abandon the dam and remove it. But the citizenry said, no, don't do that. But the citizenry wasn't willing to come up with money to pay for it. That's exactly right. Yeah, they, right. Went, yeah. they went to local, federal, and state uh, government nobody could kick in the money the public wouldn't okay. kick in the money uh, yeah. it was simply an economic decision on the part of the paper mill but mm -hmm. the people were angry for the loss of those high paying jobs to begin with and when mm -hmm. the dam removal hit the city people were really upset um, i counted 140 signs in the city against dam removal uh, really blaming dnr and and the paper company for all these disasters that were going to happen when in mm -hmm. fact turned out to be uh, an extremely positive result. They said that uh, mm -hmm. property values would drop. We uh, hired Wisconsin University of Wisconsin to uh, study that issue. Property values actually went up around the former pond. Okay. 120 acres of submerged land went to the city and became a great park. Uh, there were all kinds of advantages that accrued from avoiding the sunk cost of repairing that dam. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Bob, uh, Mike, uh, do you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, so no matter what you do, you're going to have some people that will oppose. And, you know, you, uh, I agree with the previous speaker. You know, we heard, uh, you know, the river would dry up. We also heard that uh, uh, mud flats would be exposed and it would stink and it would be unsightly and we'd see a bunch of old tires and you know, everything else. So it, with us uh, in particular, uh, Circus World Museum actually is located right on the river. And there was a mill pond backup uh, that affected Circus World Museum property. And, you know, they were really concerned that, you know, that would be very unsightly for the visitors and that 
um, uh, you know, we, we would be putting them out of business in effect. And, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, the river did not dry up. Uh, the mud flats were exposed for probably about three weeks. And then uh, the dormant seed bank that was in the mud took over. And, uh, you know, things greened up in a hurry. And it really wasn't the issues that um, uh, some of the uh, people that were opposed to the dam removals uh, came to fruition. So, you know, since that time, uh, you know, really a, a great success story. The river's a lot cleaner. Uh, we saw the return of uh, what I consider to be uh, better game fish than what we had before. Uh, obviously, it was uh, uh, very silty uh, with, the, with the dams in. Now that the dams are out, the gravel bars have been exposed. They get flushed on a regular basis. And, you know, that brings in smaller um, feed fish. And then that, that becomes then a uh, nice habitat for holding bigger game fish. So, you know, that, that, that itself is a tremendous plus. Uh, someone talked about uh, the Kiwanis uh, uh, getting on board. That was a big help for us. I think that. You know, a lot of the uh, Kiwanians are, you know, what I would consider to be the business leaders in town. And, you know, with them on board, uh, they also went to bat and said, you know, really, th this is going to be an amenity when it's done, uh, much more than it is now. And, you know, so that that helped uh, dispel some of the concern that, that some of the people had. But, but again, if you go into this thinking that you're not going to have any opposition, you better think again because you are, and you, know, you just have to be prepared mm -hmm. for it and and uh, deal with it when it comes up. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, Heath, what's the Colfax experience? What's your lesson from Colfax? Yeah, a couple of things, Duke. I think there's kind of three main things that we kind of learned there, and there's like three phases to every project basically when these occur. First phase is like the permitting and then the, actually the drawdown and then the sediment management portion. That's like all the stuff you have to do before you actually take the dam out. And then they actually have the physical removal of the structure and then the final restoration of the stream channel going through that impoundment. And the biggest thing we learned with those three stages is there's probably different players and partners in each stage. So you're gonna be working with different people uh, depending on where you're at in that process. And then also a big thing was, is be patient with the process. There's going to be a lot of curveballs thrown at you um, and things are going to have to be, um, be adaptable to, I guess, is another good example. Um, things may pop up that you weren't expecting. An example in Colfax was um, after we actually removed the structure, we had a city storm sewer pipe and a natural gas line that were exposed going through the impoundment. And so we had to re reevaluate that and kind of shift gears and have contractors come in and reset those infrastructure um, issues we had there. But so we weren't expecting that. Everybody thought, oh, it's plenty deep. Don't worry about it. It's down eight feet and it's not going to have a problem. And then the dam came out and all oh, the, the, the sewer lines exposed in the middle of the river. So uh, just be ready for stuff like that. It could happen. It may not, but just uh, be adaptable. And then be patient with the process because it's usually three to five years from start to finish to get one of these done. Sometimes even longer than that, depending on how many moving parts there are, and uh, a lot of players involved and partners to make it happen. So just uh, okay. be patient, and uh, hopefully, good things happen. Well, and I and I remember in in Colfax, you, you just became ready, uh, prepared for surprises that you couldn't even guess. That uh, if you're working away on the stream, and all of a sudden there's a there's a wire down there and it doesn't show up on any of the village diagrams or maps or uh, nobody even knows uh, when it was put there. And you don't know if it's actively being used or not. Those are the kind of surprises that it happened in Cross Plains with Black Earth Creek, too. But yeah. you just it's inherent in, in urban urban situations. Um, thank you. I'm going to uh, 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 one of our viewers asks, do the co do the communities have ongoing stream or river studies in the areas where the, f the former impoundments were temperature oxygen sediment monitoring wildlife um, uh, invasives others anybody want to go at that we did that on the deerskin dam removal uh, in violets county and studied the river for 10 years after the dam was removed there was an issue with trout we wanted to see if 
Uh, trout populations improved, whether or not the fish moved in different places, uh, how much they were able to um, access habitats, you know, between the winter habitat, the growth habitat, and the spawning habitat within the Deerskin River. And those mm -hmm. were all positive. Uh, we didn't have any adverse effect on the warm water fishery that was there. Uh, it really was overall uh, an improvement of the entire system to remove that dam uh, based on the 10 years of data. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we have a question about, uh, uh, well, and, and one of the benefits that we have in River Falls is we've got 30 years of monitoring data uh, that's, been, uh, that's been done by the uh, particular thermal monitoring data that's been done by the Trout Unlimited chapter. And it's, um, it's been, a, a, you know, I think a huge factor in the civic considerations leading up to that decision. Um, we also have a, a, uh, a question about what ongoing responsibilities did the community, local government or DNR or others have for maintaining and I'm assuming that's going to be maintaining the uh, the area of the former impoundment. Uh, but then there's another side of it, uh, sediment removal uh, or other parts, ongoing responsibilities. Now, now Heath, uh, Colfax is a village park and the village maintains it and the stream is in great shape. There's really not any uh, responsibility except fisheries management oversight for that section of uh, the stream, are there? Yeah, basically, I think we do do kind of kind of relates to the last question too. We do do an annual survey in the old apartment fish survey. Mm -hmm. We've done that since 1997, so we got almost 25 years of data going through that mm -hmm. section of the river. And also to kind of ask, answer the last one too, the local high school biology teacher <laughs> uses that stream corridor for like an environmental classroom. So like all dam removals that options there. If you're in a city or a municipality, maybe to have an environmental or a classroom in the old impoundment stream corridor. So that's kind of neat that they're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, yep. In the case of Colfax, pretty much the, the impoundment itself, all the landowners that were around that tr structure quit claim deeds back to the village. So it actually was private ownership when the dam was removed and we got 40 people to agree to give that land back to the village, which is amazing. I don't know if you'd be able to do that nowadays, but then they were willing to do that to make the project successful. So the village actually owns the whole impoundment um, bed mm -hmm. now, or the old mm -hmm. impoundment bed. Mm -hmm. And they mow that every year, um, keep it nice and green, and then they leave a riparian buffer along the stream um, to protect water quality and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's pretty okay. much a village ownership. We don't do a lot there anymore other than our fish survey. Um, if something happened there, we'd maybe come in and help fix something, but we haven't had any issues there. The thing has held up really well. That project's okay. been 23 years ago now that we did that okay. work. So. Okay, thanks. And At, and at the Bob, Ward Dam, at the, Ward Dam the, uh, the land was... Uh, ceded to the city uh, by the paper company. It was 120 acres, two miles of river, and uh, DNR uh, gave a stewardship grant to develop a park there. The design of the park was such that it, the, the goal was to make it as maintenance-free as possible for the city. So it was really wildlife habitat trails and uh, a few city structures that they needed for some other purpose. But really there, there hasn't been that much cost uh, considering how many acres of land are involved. Um, the habitat work was actually in stream, uh, it was boulder retards, things like that. Um, things that had very little maintenance. Uh, the structures were, were really not uh, a problem for the city. On the other hand, the, uh, the use went way up uh, in the park. And uh, I, I think the, the average person living in the area believes it's an asset compared to the shallow uh, sediment filled pond that they had before with very little access to the to the flowage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, Mike on the Baraboo, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the land ownership along the river. Is that uh, is that in city hands or, or how, how is that handled? The vast majority is in city hands and, and was prior to uh, the dams coming out. There, there were a few private property owners uh, along one segment of the river that we uh, actually purchased um, some riverfront property uh, through the stewardship program in order to be able to put the river walked in. Uh, but the vast majority of it already was parkland because it was typically mm -hmm. a floodplain anyhow. Mm -hmm. So there really wasn't a lot down there. Now there was a segment again, I had mentioned that the area down by Circus World Museum 
that actually is uh, uh, belongs to the State Historical Society. Uh, but even there, uh, the, 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 the state owns uh, the property, so it's still available for us to be able to do the things that we needed to do. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I, I can't speak to other communities because I'm not real sure how, how the ownership uh, issues were there, but we didn't have a lot of that problem in, in Maribel. And, and again, mainly because a lot of it was under our control to begin with. Okay. Okay. Um, we've had some questions about uh, sediment management and the uh, the Colfax Dam was about 14 or 15 feet high, and the uh, Merrill Dam was probably 20-ish, something like that, 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. And um, how how did you handle the sediment management? What's a, what's the best time to do it, and who did it? Well, the, the Moore Dam situation was much different than the dam upstream. The Prairie Drills Dam had a 65-foot head, so there was a lot of gradient there, and some of the head walls on the exposed uh, sediment were 12 to 15 feet, very unstable, but they did stabilize over time with just natural vegetation. There was no shaping of the uh, uh, shoreline or anything like that. In the ward situation, we simply dewatered slowly in the fall, and then uh, by the time springtime came around, we had frozen soils to work on, very little restructuring there because the gradient was small. Um, by the time two weeks were out, it was already starting to get green. And by the time uh, a month went out, we had enough root structure there to hold the sediment and rain events. And as the, as the uh, root structure developed, uh, we just didn't see any reason to redisturb the soils and recontour, uh, mainly because it was a fairly flat area anyway, uh, unlike Prairie Dells, which had a, quite a steep head. Sure. But okay. at Prairie Dells, we had 20,000 cubic yards of sediment. Uh, that was our original estimate. We took that out with a, with a sediment trap downstream, but um, there was still way over 20,000 cubic yards that went downstream. So there was mm -hmm. uh, the, the downstream area below the dam went from a boulder garden, sediment starved, to a completely covered sand flat all the way down below the dam. And uh, it took almost a year and a half for that to move on down through the system. Uh, okay. But, but yep. uh, you know, regular rainfall and, and flood events in the spring took that out in, in a short period of time. Okay. We have a question about impact on uh, wildlife like turtles, beavers, frogs, birds, uh, fishes other than trout. Um, how, did, how, did those, uh, how did those streams change? Uh, well, I, I remember being on uh, in Colfax when it was about a foot and a half deep sand flat above the dam, and there wasn't hardly a fish to be found there. Uh, so that that's a dramatic change. Now it's a, trout, a brook trout stream. But tell me a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about uh, other species and uh, uh, is there is some of this beaver habitat? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's in an urban setting. So, I mean, some of the wildlife um, is a little more like an urban wildlife setting, but um, there's occasional otter in there now. They come on the Red Cedar River. Um, it's connected to the Red Cedar. Um, we also have a lot of stuff like waterfall that kind of use that part through town, especially during seasonal migrations now. And then um, the fish community was probably the biggest thing that, that shifted there. I mean, we had pretty much a warm water fish community that's shifted to basically like a cool cold water fish community. And, you know, we had, when we did our fish survey work, the IBI scores, which are kind of like your index of biotic integrity tell, tells you how healthy that system is, went from like a 20 beforehand on a scale of hundred and was 90 afterwards. So um, we definitely improved the fishery in that section of the river and it's more um, um, comprehensive to what it was before the dam was there. But uh, like in the case of Colfax, with it being such an urban setting, um, there's not a ton of wildlife there because, it's, you know, there's houses all around and stuff like that. But um, there is okay. some access from the Red Cedar, so otter and stuff like that do frequent that section of the river now. So. Mm -hmm. Ward, the Ward Pond uh, was right in an urban area in the city of Merrill, um, but it became a real birding mecca. People started to really use that area for birding because there was such a wide variety of habitats. The fishery is much better because the dam was less than a mile from the Wisconsin River. Once the dam was taken out, 
we had a good overlap fishery. The warm water fish came up from the Wisconsin, cold water fish were in the prairie, and at different times of different seasons, they would move back and forth. The smallmouth bass really uh, colonized the upper river above the dam where all those uh, boulder retards are. And then the uh, brook trout from the Prairie River would come downstream to spend time in the winter for winter habitat because the river was larger, even going out into the Wisconsin River and then coming back into the Prairie for the following season. So mm -hmm. we had fish moving back and forth. The warm and cold water fishes were, were uh, overlapping in the river, whereas it, with the dam there, none of those fish could get to those habitats they, did, they needed seasonally. So the, I think it's a lot more stable fishery than we had before, in addition to a lot more variety. I think, I think they've found that in dam, dam removals across the country, situations where uh, uh, dams have been impounding or, or uh, interrupting fish habitat for many years. Perhaps that might be one species that uh, is kind of the, uh, the signature species in, in the East Coast. It might be Atlantic salmon, of which there are very few. But what they find when they take out the dam is that millions of shad run up those streams for the first time in 250 years. Uh, and, and so the, the, the whole assemblage of migratory fishes, and we're, we're learning and learning and learning about those migratory fishes, uh, uh, get to exercise that migratory tendency where they haven't been able to do that in those for, forever and ever. So that's- One that's wildlife thing- one wildlife uh, incident we we observed was people insisted on planting rye in the in the uh, flats, the bud flats. So we did plant a little bit of rye because they wanted to do it. Well, what happened was when that rye grew up and the seeds were there, there were all kinds of mice out there, and there was all kinds of cover for the mice. So we saw raptors all over the place after those mice. There were quite a few snakes in there after the mice as well. Um, but it, I think if we had just left it alone, the natural vegetation would have taken over and there would have been less of that. But people absolutely uh, demanded that rye be planted in those mm. in those flats. So we did it for them. But, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting uh, raptor uh, observation point. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and when you talk about particular fish assemblages that are sort of based on the cold water assemblage, that's, that's trout are sort of the apex species, but there are a lot of white suckers and sculpins and dace and, and other fish that are attuned to that cold water stuff. And when you start to get to cool water, that's smallmouth bass and walleyes and northerns and, and in, in, uh, in Baraboo, uh, Mike and Joe Burkle would tell you the number of species that they saw in the impoundments when there were dams uh, consisted of suckers and red horse and a few minnow species that are attuned to cool, cool water or warm water. Uh, and then the number of species that are now in there, now that it's a cool water flowing stream, it's not a trout stream, but it's a smallmouth bass stream. It's a walleye stream. It's a panfish stream. It's got a lot of different species in there. Uh, and all the minnow species that go with cool water systems. So it's, it's much more diverse. Um, um, I can tell you also that uh, we're actually getting some sturgeon coming in from the Wisconsin River. They're coming up uh, into the uh, gravel uh, <laughs> upstream. So, you know, it's, it, yeah, I mean, the change has been dramatic. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what else to, to say. Um, you know, we're seeing walleyes. We, we weren't catching walleyes before. We, you know, smallmouth bass, you get one occasionally. Now it's it's um, it's commonplace, mm -hmm. and the amount of people that are actually fishing in the urban setting um, along the river, right across from my office, as a matter of fact, uh, on a daily basis, I see fishermen out there just about every day, as long as the weather's decent. <laughs> well, and 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 as a as a as a sometime paddler, to be on on a river that has sturgeon, uh, sturgeon have a tendency to leap out of the water. Uh, and if you're paddling along and, and all of a sudden a five foot or six foot sturgeon comes up just completely out of the water and whacks down not far from you, it's a it's a startling experience, but it's pretty neat. Almost, almost sounds like a beaver tail. <laughs> it does. It does. We have a question about 
that sediment load that went down from your projects, did that affect mussel habitat and survival and mussel beds that you know of? Was that a concern on your streams? We have a lot of fall on, on the Baraboo River in the area where the dams came out. There's 35 feet of fall at about four and a half miles. Um, you know, that, that immediately uh, flushed out. Uh, and, you know, the gradient then kind of flattens out to get into the Wisconsin, but there, there's enough water that runs through that river in the springtime that I, I think those sediment loads were out of there in probably less than a couple of years. Mm -hmm. okay. we, didn't, we didn't do a, an official study on it, but mm -hmm. you could just tell the quality of the water was getting much better um, quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Heath or Bob? Well, we didn't have uh, mussel studies in the prairie, but on the Wisconsin River, the mussel populations were, were really bad in the Wisconsin River because of low dissolved oxygen during the polluted days. And they hadn't really recovered all that much by the time this dam removal occurred. But because the fish can move now, they can move those mussel species from the Wisconsin River out into the prairie and upstream because the fish carry the larval mussels uh, in, in their gills and they can move long distances that way. So I think it, uh, with the dam gone, there'll be a greater chance of reestablishing all the mussel populations that could live in the Prairie River from the remnants in the Wisconsin. So although we temporarily had a lot of sediment problems that probably affected some mussels in the stream, I don't think there were a lot of them below the Prairie Dells Dam because the area was so sediment starved. It was nothing but rock down below and boulders and, and gravel. There wasn't a lot of really good substrate for uh, a diverse mussel population, but um, uh, we didn't actually do studies uh, to determine the impacts there. And the okay. Deer State River we did, and that and that uh, was a, a very healthy mussel population after dam removal. Okay. There again, okay. we had warm water fishes coming up from the, uh, the area downstream of the deer skin. And I think in, in the, over the long term, that will help improve the diversity of mussel species uh, if the fish has have access to the entire river system instead of being blocked by a dam. Okay, let's let's talk for a minute about river users. Um, how uh, any of you, uh, Mike, you may have some observations about uh, what you've seen for the changes in use of the river and the and the area along the river uh, since the the dams were taken out. Okay, well, uh, first of all, uh, kayak use and canoe use on the river has dramatically increased. Uh, there actually is a, a kayak uh, and canoe livery um, out of uh, North Freedom, Wisconsin, which is uh, two villages up from uh, the city of Baraboo. And we have installed uh, a canoe and kayak launch, uh, a, a very substantial one uh, in Baraboo. There's also one in, Bar in West Baraboo. There's one uh, uh, on county owned land uh, between West Baraboo and, and uh, North Freedom. And then of course, there's another one in North Freedom. So none of those existed uh, to any developed state prior to the dams coming out, obviously, because you really couldn't go anywhere. The, you, had all the, you had this series of dams on the river. Um, but, you know, so I had mentioned fishing already. We're seeing fishermen on the river. We're seeing um, uh, a lot of uh, kayak and, and uh, canoe usage. Uh, and there's also been a lot of economic benefit along the river, uh, other than the uh, other than the uh, kayak rental that's up in, in uh, North Freedom, we've got uh, a distillery on the river now that is uh, right in the city of Baraboo. Uh, it's on a nice, fast flowing segment of the river. We've got a big patio out in the back of the distillery where people, it's a restaurant also. Uh, people can go and have their lunch and, and watch the paddlers go by. And uh, if there is no paddlers at the time, it's still you get the sound of the water moving by, and it, it's very relaxing out there. So, you know, that was uh, a, a 
a big uh, deal for uh, the city of Baraboo to be able to, to uh, have that opportunity available to them. Uh, right now on the other side of the river, we're getting uh, 63 nice apartment units being constructed. It's about a $6 million construction project. And uh, that's going to bring 63 families or, or individuals, whatever, uh, that are going to have their apartments with nice views of the river. It's just, you know, we built our, our new city hall uh, right along the river bank. So, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing development occur uh, that would not, in my estimation, have occurred uh, with all of those mill ponds on it because all it was was just stagnant water. Uh, you know, it really didn't have any eye appeal, but now with the ripples and the, you know, the sound of the moving water, I think is just very soothing for people. Uh, <laughs> the river walk also is um, uh, heavily used, uh, mm -hmm. hundreds of people a day. Mm -hmm. And and you also have the Ice Age Trail along the river, don't you? Yeah. So when we built the river walk, uh, when we started, you know, we had a plan and. Uh, Work the plan, obviously. When the Ice Age Trail people came up to Baraboo and saw what we had, uh, they asked us if we would, uh, you know, consider having the trail run right along the river walk. We said absolutely. So right now, the uh, Ice Age Trail and uh, the uh, partially constructed Great Sauk State Trail that's going to run from Dane County up through Reedsburg and then connect to the 400 trail, uh, that, that's probably uh, gonna be a, you know, a 15 to 20 year build out because you've got all of these different mm -hmm. municipal entities that it's gonna meander through. But um, I mean, it's, it's really gonna be a destination. And you talked about the Kiwanis before uh, and they're uh, taking on the um, uh, river, uh, the Riverwalk project. So the way it's been working is this, you know, we will you know, we get a segment that we're going to improve. We will go to the stewardship uh, people at the DNR. Uh, they will fund 50% of the cost of whatever it is that we're doing. Then 25% comes from the city and 25% comes from the Kiwanis. So that's how we do it. So from a taxpayer standpoint, you're getting a river walk constructed for 25% of the cost that it would have cost if you would have had to do it on your own. That's a tremendous, uh, that's a tremendous savings. Last year, we put in a $400,000 pedestrian bridge over the river just east of Circus Road Museum. Very heavily used. It now forms a real nice about a two-mile loop the people can park at Circus Road Museum's parking lot, go over the bridge, do the whole loop, come back around uh, through the parking lot and back to their car, and they never cross the same part of water twice. So uh, that's pretty impressive, also. So mm -hmm. there's a lot going on. I, I was I was impressed uh, along the trail in Baraboo with uh, the use of kiosks to talk about Baraboo's heritage uh, yes. from the, the, the role of the Ho-Chunk Nation that lived at the rapids before European settlement and used it as a fish trap area and had a hundred uh, mounds that are now under underneath East Baraboo most, for the most part uh, and other historic things that are really well explained that uh, people might never have known about uh, but they're they're it's like having historical markers along the highway uh, you can learn an awful lot by by what they have to offer i thought that was a really nice touch i saw some of that in in uh, merrill as well bob yeah uh, the, and the city has taken over maintenance of those trails and and yes, uh in, in merrill too as well right yes uh, um, Prairie Dells Dam had a lot of gradients, so there's not many trails up there, but it became a, a destination area for whitewater kayaking. Uh, it's a canyon with 65 foot drop, uh, so it, it really is quite a good whitewater kayaking area. But the Ward Dam is a lower gradient, so the, the two mile section that was impounded became two miles of trail on one side of the river and two miles on the other side. The Merrill High School is right on the edge of the pond of the old impoundment. 
So the people from the high school use it for biology classes and for just for FIAD and, and walking. Uh, one of the big impacts of removal of the, of the ward dam was that there were at least 60 to 80 houses below that dam that could not get bank financing for expansions because they were in the uh, dam break analysis flood zone, um, the flood shadow from the dam break analysis. So even the, even the Merrill Library expansion, uh, the banks were reluctant to fund it because they were in that shadow of the dam, dam break analysis. But once the dam was removed, there was no dam break analysis necessary. It just went mm -hmm. back to the regular floodplain zoning. So a lot mm -hmm. of those houses were able to get bank financing uh, that they would not have been able to get with the dam in place. Okay, uh, let me ask, uh, since you're, uh, those, those rivers are paddled and they're fished, is there any conflicts between paddlers and, and, uh, and anglers on those rivers? We haven't seen much of that in Baraboo. Okay. okay. I've not seen that on the prairie. Yep, okay, and Heath, you, you, you'd only be able to have a one foot kayak on 18 mile creek, right? Yeah, you're more likely to see kids playing in the creek and maybe some inner tubes, but not much for kayak in there. So <laughs> okay. They do play okay. down there quite a bit. A lot of a lot of youth in the down by the stream playing around during the summer and stuff like that. But I think that's mm -hmm. one thing that's beneficial is getting people out of the house and enjoying the outdoors and those definitely old and pounded old and pounded areas allow that opportunity. So one, one thing about Prairie Dells with the with the conflicts is that the kayakers are there at really high flow. They want to get there in the springtime or when major rainfall, so they have major uh, holes and, and all sorts of uh, hydraulics. The fishermen are not there during that time of the year. Uh, they don't want high flows, so they're at a, a separate time period hydrologically. Mm -hmm. yeah. let, me, let me ask how, if any of you have any observations about how the dam removals are uh, no, no, before, before we get to that, let, I have a, a question for Mike. Uh, Mike, are you seeing uh, the interest in more use of the river and more use along the river? Is that primarily local people or is it people from outside the community that are coming in as, as visitors? Oh, we're definitely getting both. I think, uh, you know, is it 50-50? Is, is it more, you know, uh, people coming in or locals? You know, mm -hmm. that's really hard to, to gauge, but I can tell you that we do get people that are coming up here uh, to do a weekend's worth of paddling. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have people that come up here, or, or the people that live here, uh, you know, that are doing exactly the same thing, same thing with fishing. So, you know, with Devil's Lake right down the block and the Dells just north of us, I mean, we, we see a lot of tourists, and a lot of <laughs> tourism. And, uh, you know, so some people might come up to go to the Dells, but, you know, after a couple of days, they're ready to try something else. And, you know, I think that, you know, having the river amenity that that we now have, that attracts people uh, to come and stay. Well, and, and and your area is rich in attractions and some more are coming. The, the former Badger Army ammunition plant down the road uh, is going to be 7,000 acres of public land that's going to be available soon. And you have those beautiful clefts, Parfrey's Glen and other places along the along the bluffs. And just to the east up the Wisconsin River, you have uh, uh, Aldo Leopold Shack and the Aldo Leopold Foundation. So I can I can see a wonderful day over there with uh, with uh, lunch at the distillery, uh, a walk through Devil's Lake and the shack, uh, probably late afternoon at the Wallersheim Winery a little bit down the road and then uh, Toddle to a motel room. Uh, <laughs> so you, 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 just, you, you, you just signed an advertisement. That's exactly. What you're <laughs> well, let me let me ask if you have any reflections on uh, on how your your dam removals in your communities may have equipped uh, the river or the communities to be uh, better able to deal with what they talk about as far as future manifestations of climate change in the in the state in the area uh i think that you know in in particular the fact that we have eliminated the dams and, and allowed the river to be free flowing in the case of high water um you know the water right now uh 
um, is is able to you know get to where it needs to go, which is the Wisconsin River, at, at a much better um, uh, time frame than it did before. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know as far as um, increasing the amount of diversity on the river um, with the different uh, fish colonies and and wildlife that we are now seeing certainly helps uh, try to mitigate some of the uh, negative effects that climate change has. The, the ward dam was in a city of Merrill, which is about 8,000 people. And um, yeah, I think the idea there was that there were, there were backups routinely in the storm sewer system in that city. Um, and you know it would start with the pond and then move back up, up the system. Now with the dam removed, there's a 120 acre flood retention zone down there that wasn't there before. Several feet of head have, have changed the, uh, the, the amount of water you can accommodate. And one of the big impacts in Northern Wisconsin climate change is a substantial increase in the amount of rainfall and the, uh, the episodic nature of large rainfalls that cause some real problems for municipal systems. So I think that uh, that, that uh, stormwater management has been improved after the dam is removed in Merrill. And I think that the river itself is more diverse. Diverse systems are more resistant to all kinds of stressors, uh, including climate change. So it's got to impact or, or improve the fishery's ability to, to manage change if it's more diverse. Bob, with these high intensity, short duration events that we've been seeing that, uh, you know, Mike and Baraboo had to deal with huge, practically state record, all time record rainfalls a few years ago. We did over here. Uh, is, are, those, are those homes that are downstream from the former dam in Merrill uh, at less hazard now? Well, the dam was in such poor repair uh, after 100 years of very little maintenance that that dam was ready to go just about any time. As I mentioned earlier, they had before the dam was removed, they had already paid in the previous year $100,000 in flooding damages uh, because one of the gates got stuck and they couldn't open the gate enough to pass the water. It was mm -hmm. that bad. Uh, in addition, the, the uh, dam was not designed for the amount of water that that watershed yields now. There is more water and the episodic nature of the floods are greater than when the dam was designed back in 1905. So, you know, the combination of poor maintenance and more water and, and more uh, episodic flood events, I think creates a greater hazard for those houses downstream if the dam had been retained. Okay. Heath, anything to add beyond what, what Bob had to say? No, I just think like for trout streams, obviously the impoundment creates a thermal, negative thermal impact on the trout stream, trout in cold water. Um, if you have a small to medium sized or even large dam on a trout stream, it warms the water up. So removing that structure, you're sure. going to see a thermal benefit for the cold water fish community. And with, you know, forecasted predictions and increase in climate and things like that, that's going to benefit the trout fishery by having the impoundment removed. So, um, okay. Well, the only okay. exception that might be the Bighorn River, Montana Duke. That's probably the one dam you wouldn't want to take out to maintain a trout fishery. <laughs> that's but, uh, right. That's but, right. Uh, most, yeah. In most circumstances, it's a positive impact on the mm -hmm. trout stream. So sure. And I think in uh, addition to warming the water in the summer, you get colder water in the winter, which adversely affects egg development for salmon. And so you know, it, it's a it's a double whammy: uh, too okay. warm in the summer, too cold in the winter, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's not good. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me let me ask probably Mike this question. Mike, uh, in addition to the Kiwanis and DNR and city already mentioned, uh, what other agencies or organizations were partners in the removal and the post removal uh, on the on the river? Um, well, we had a group that we formed. It was called Citizens for Waterfront Revitalization. And uh, you know, we had a lot of old structures on the river. We, you know, the, the, the city built up a, along the river. I mean, that's, that, that was the founding of the city, obviously, was because of the water power. Uh, but there were a lot of old derelict, you know, structures. And, uh, you know, the, back in the day, um, a lot of sanitary sewers emptied into the river. It was just, you know, 
people used it as kind of the back door of the city and, and really didn't pay a lot of attention to it. You know, and we knew that was wrong. And with the dams coming out, uh, this group, and it wasn't a real big group, probably had about 20 active members, but we uh, did some things. We had, uh, we called it the Baraboo Rapids River Days, where we had uh, different activities and educational opportunities along the river. Uh, Walleyes for North America came in and had a fishery for the kids. Uh, each child that came got a, uh, a fairly decent Zeppo rod reel to take home with them. And, you know, it was, and they all, each kid had, had an adult fisherman with them, you know, showed them how to bait hooks and where to fish and, you know, do all of that stuff. And, you know, it, it was a tremendous uh, uh, reintroduction of the river to the residents. I think that that was uh, key in, in getting people to be reintroduced to the wonderful river that, that ran through their community instead of just, you know, the only time we'd see it is when we drove over the bridge. And, and now, we're, now we're seeing people walk along it, we're seeing people fish on it, we're seeing people canoe it. It's wonderful. Good. Good. Let me, we're, we're getting down here, uh, and I, I don't want to uh, tax, tax people's time more than, more than, we, more than we intended to for this hour. Uh, but I, would, would any of you like to talk about what you see as the greatest opportunities for these communities going forward? Mike, you've, had, you've talked about the plans and the prospects. I'm really... I'm, I'd be really excited if I was in Baraboo and I was a, a business person or a resident of Baraboo. Um, could you, do any of you have ideas about the greatest ongoing opportunity and the greatest ongoing challenge for the communities where these projects have taken place? Well, as far as opportunity, go ahead. Mike, go, Mike, go ahead. Yeah. Well, as, as far as opportunities are concerned, I mean, we're starting to see people actually do new construction along the riverfront. We moved to Baraboo in 1988. And from 1988 until just a few years ago, nothing, zero, got built upon the river. When we started constructing the river walk, when the dams came out, when, the, when, when people started paying attention to what a wonderful asset the river was, we started seeing big, bigger development projects happen along the river. And again, I had mentioned the distillery. Uh, we have a rail museum that, that's in the, in the redevelopment area. Uh, the city hall and police station, obviously, I had mentioned. Uh, in the 63 units uh, of brand new apartments that are being built. It's a, it's a brick apartment building. It's gorgeous. It's got balconies overlooking the river. Uh, that's bringing people right down to the riverfront. That's where they're going to live. Nobody lived on the riverfront before. Nobody. Mm -hmm. it, was, mm -hmm. it, it was pretty incredible. So what we're seeing is a transformation in the way people are thinking about the river. And, you know, I, we're not done by a long shot in what we believe we're going to see just an economic benefit as far as increased tax base and increased activity along the river uh, with people living there. Well, you know, once those apartments uh, fill up, and, and again, it, it's scheduled to be done either late this fall or early next spring, uh, I can guarantee you we're going to start to see some of the uh, older storefronts in the area get purchased. And, you know, um, there will be you know, certainly commercial opportunities for people with all with the families that are moving into those apartments. Uh, you know, that's going to stimulate uh, commercial growth. You, you know, Mike, that that reminds me of uh eau claire when i moved to there in 1988 and lived there until for 25 years and when i first moved there I was still in the recovery process from the passage of the clean water act and a lot of old timers in eau claire just considered the rivers to be a sump and yep. my my colleagues my my students that i graduated from high school with in 1970 
who went there, I said, God, you got two great rivers there. Why, do you use them? And they said, oh, you can't go in those rivers. You'd have to get your stomach pumped. Well, they improved. And by the time I moved there, there was starting to be a change in that focus to look from looking away from the river or treating it as a refuse area to using the river. And now it has bike trails and the farmer's market and new park land and, and a whole new attitude toward, toward what a river can be as the lifeblood of a community. Uh, I think the, that one of the really intriguing things about what's going on in River Falls is that same opportunity is, is beckoning. So, uh, you know, if we can be in a situation where we can take these older impoundments and turn them into a new asset for a community, uh, that, that community uh, has a lot of benefit to, uh, to recognize out of it. Bob or Heath, anything that you, that you see? Well, the Ward Impoundment, Ward Dam, was right in the center of the city. And it, it's really important, I think, for them to, to have 120 acres of open land in the center of the city that they didn't have before. There's all kinds of things you can use that land for over time uh, compared to the uh, utility of that pond that was already silted in. Uh, it, it's, it's really a substantial change in the, in the downtown area, uh, not to mention all the recreation. There were 90 houses around that pond. Every one of those houses is worth more money now. Uh, the properties are, are worth more now. And the, uh, the potential there for people upgrading those properties is great because of the amenity of the park and a trout stream running through the park. So it's pretty substantial. Uh, when the Prairie River uh, jumps from an average flow of 100 CFS to over 1,000 CFS, they're really happy that they got 120 acres of uh, new flood control down there instead of backing it up in the city's storm sewer system because yeah. the city is literally surrounding that pond. Okay, great. And Heath? Yeah, I just think the biggest thing is you can uh, you reconnect the community to the river. And you know, like I mentioned before, Colfax, one of the biggest things I saw was this, the local school district getting involved in doing the environmental education in the river corridor. And that's kind of something that it's kind of neat about it, getting the community back involved in the river and kind of, you know, seeing that restored and having those people part of that process. So that's what I would add okay. to that question. Sure, sure. It's, it's 801, folks, and, uh, and I'm really grateful for all our speakers have, have had to say tonight. And, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank the Kinney CC for sponsoring. Uh, and, and if any of you had, any of you, Bob, Mike, and and Heath have any uh, concluding uh, things to offer us, uh, please, please, uh, this is a good time to take a minute and do that. I think I've been involved in a number of dam removals and I think it, it really illustrates the difference between fear and opportunity. People fear change, any kind of change. And they, they translate that into opposition to projects that eventually could benefit everyone. And I think we see that over and over again in dam removal situations. Starts out with fear, anger, resentment, opposition. By the time the project is all over, people are supporting what it has become because of the amenities that result and the cost savings that result. So it's a really good uh, demonstration of, of human uh, vacillation between fear and acceptance mm -hmm. and eventually uh, praise for mm -hmm. the for projects mm -hmm. okay Heath? yeah i would just kind of reiterate what i said kind of earlier just be patient with the process there's going to be lots of ups and downs crooks and turns and things maybe show up that you're not expecting but it's well worth it in the end when it's all done and uh just uh take things as they come and be adaptable i think bob kind of mentioned that too earlier too is be adaptable and and uh Good things will hopefully happen when you're all finished. So that's great. Thanks. And Mike? Stay the course. You're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for those observations. I can, I can tell you, having been involved in uh, quite a number of dam debates over the years, some, some you win, some you lose. But, but the, 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 they haven't grown up in a small town. I understand that that smaller towns, my town of a thousand, had a tremendous resistance to change, uh, and that for a lot of people, that uncertainty is 
is uh, daunting when you start to talk about something that nobody can envision, that it's really hard to envision what a what a community would be like that has always had a dam in their memory, their parents' memory, their grandparents' memory, and so on, uh, and that it's gonna change. But uh, in the long run, uh, those communities seem to adapt and, and, and come to appreciate the asset that's there as a result of uh, having gone through with the project. Uh, so, you know, I don't remember think- that, yeah, Remember yeah. Since, since 1960, Wisconsin has removed 150 dams. You're not going to be the first in this. Every 150 communities have gotten through this since 1960. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for being involved, both our speakers and, uh, and the folks who listened and gave us good questions. It's really been a treat to, uh, to have this conversation. I, I, I'm personally grateful and the Kinney CC is really grateful for what you've contributed to help River Falls tonight. So thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Duke. Thank you. Bye-bye.